All right. So like I mentioned before, when you guys came in, we're going to talk about long-term athletic development. You know, and so probably the first question you have is why do I have a wheat field on my slide? You know, kind of the background of my whole presentation. You know, and really what we want to talk about you know, is long-term. You know, so what we are doing as far as our training programs is a lot of times we start kids when they're in middle school. And we'll train them all the way through high school. And if they're lucky enough to continue it with their sporting career, you know, into the college ranks as well. Uh, so the reason I put the uh, sort of the farming picture on there is because of the law of the farm. If you've ever uh, read anything by Dr. Stephen Covey, he wrote the book, The Seven ha Habits of Highly Effective People, which is an excellent resource just for life in general. It has nothing to do with strength and conditioning. But it's an excellent read just about being highly effective as a human being and some of the strategies that go about it. And in that book, he talks about the law of the farm, you know, which basically I've broken down here into the three Ps. There's a process to it. There's planning that needs to be done. And you need to be patient. You know, and that's the biggest keys as far as long-term athletic development and also farming. You know, there's a process to farming as far as preparing the soil, planting the seeds, irrigating it, you know, making sure the sunlight and all that stuff so that they will be able to grow to their fullest potential. And that takes some planning. You know, in the book, Covey talks about a certain kind of potato, and I don't know anything about farming, but a certain type of potato that you actually have to, you have to prepare the soil for two years. You actually have to plant something and then kill it so that it nurtures the soil so that you can grow this certain type of potato. You know, there is a planning to farming and to athletic development. And that it takes time. There is, the patience is very necessary. Yeah, we do a lot of testing with our athletes. We're going to test them before they come in and afterwards. And most of the time we get really good results. Sometimes we don't. And I'll talk about why that happens sometimes. It's usually based off where they are developmentally as far as the results that they have the potential to gain in any short time frame. But patience is the key. This development pyramid is kind of breaks down everything that we do in our program. You notice it's built like a pyramid, and that's important. The base of the pyramid is foundational movement. Foundational movement is made up of a number of qualities here. You know, some of the things that we work on, soft tissue work, mobility, stability, fundamental movement skills, which is abbreviated FMS, and then this FMS, is trademarked, it's a test that we do. It's called the functional movement screen. It's one of the tests that we take our athletes through, which actually looks at how they move, if they have any dysfunction with certain movements. So it's a, they're different. That's why I put them both down there. On top of that foundational movement, we have functional performance, change of direction, landing skills, speed, power development, strength, core stability. There are others. They wouldn't all fit on the pyramid that are built on top of the foundational movement. And then the very top is your sports skill, which here, as far as actually working on sports skill, we'll do some sports-specific work. You know, and that's just, just based off our staff. You know, sometimes, after we're done with our workouts, if we have a soccer player, they're working with Afrin. He was an old American soccer player. They might do a little something, you know, working on whatever. You know, I was a football player in college. You know, I've had, we had some linemen in here and we got a little sweaty and I ended up cutting my eye. We'll do some of that work. And then we also have the hockey treadmill where our hockey athletes actually get some specific work for their sport with that type of conditioning on there. The reason I put this pyramid up here is that oftentimes it's built upside down. You know, what we found, especially around here, and it's not necessarily the fault of anyone, there hasn't been a center like us that works on these foundational levels. So what we've found after a year and a half of being in business is that the kids we train are busy, which is good. I'd rather have them running around doing sport after sport than sitting on the couch or playing video games or whatever. But they do a whole lot of skill work. You know, in the summertime, we got kids who are trying to train here, and yet they're going to five camps. They're going to take five weeks out of the summer. You know, as a 12-year-old 
and go to this camp and then this camp and then this camp and then this camp. Yeah, and that's not necessarily the right way to do it. Again, depending on developmentally where they are, and I will cover that. But you need to have these foundational levels, and that's what we provide here. And that provides you a higher ceiling to grow your sports skill so that you can actually you know, improve your sports skill, whatever that is. This is looking at the fundamental movement skills, which again is on the base of the pyramid, right down here. Very important. So you see it's kind of broken down into categories here. This I stole from a presentation from Dr. Greg Rose, uh, who is the, uh, the head of the Titleist Performance Institute. That's their logo there. Uh, basically, golf. You know, Titleist has a, a program, an institute, where they are looking to build golfers from a physical level very early on. Next Olympics in Rio, golf will be an Olympic sport. So they've, you know, going back about 12 years, they've been developing. And a lot of this research I kind of stole from a presentation that I heard him uh, this summer. And it, it really pertains to all sports, not just golf. But you see it broken down here, stability, pushing, pulling, balance, dodging, bend, roll, stretch, you know, you can read it all the way through. You know, object control, locomotion, awareness. When you look at that, it's PE. You know, again, these fundamental movement skills need to be developed very early on. And so there's the importance of good physical education to develop all these skills. Also, another way to do it is to play a lot of sports. And when we talk about long-term athletic development, that is one of the keys to becoming, to reaching a high level in sport, is that when you're younger, you have a lot of sports. You get a lot of exposure to all these different categories here, all those different attributes. So you're working and developing all those at a very early age. So we have a little debate here. We got all these things that we, got, you know, we want to work on. What do we do? What do we not do? Well, really, you know, the debate is not what we should do. It's when. Yeah, and when we're talking about long-term athletic development, it's a term that's thrown around more in Olympic training centers where you have kids that get interjected very early on and want to be the next whatever eight years from now, you know, two Olympics from now. And it's when we want to go through all those things. And that's where all the research has come from. Because we look at kids, these two are the same age. Something's up. <laughs> you know, something's up. Something happened in this guy that hasn't happened here yet. You know, basically he's gone through a growth spurt. He's more physically mature than this other guy. And we want to, we have to appreciate that. Research tells us plus or minus three years. So you take any 12-year-old, and you could be looking at a 9-year-old or a 15-year-old. And that's important because there are some sports where they all get grouped together. Hockey, soccer, those are age-based sports. Now, if you ask a hockey parent how old their kid is, they're going to tell you what year they're born. You know, I'm in 92. And then you have to do math, and you look you know, like an idiot. Yeah, and that's very true. You ask anybody that plays hockey how old they are, they will tell you what year they're born in. Because that's how they group all their kids together. That's how they form their teams. So what happens is, you know, from Canada, you know, I, as part of the, you know, in the newspaper I put, you know, the, this research comes from Canada and the United States. Canada made a big push a number of years ago to try to not push so many kids out of hockey. Because what happens is, your under 12 hockey team, you, know, you got kids that developmentally are nine years old. They don't play. They hate the sport because they don't ever play, and they get out of it. And then once they you know, go through their little growth spurt and they catch up, they could be a pretty darn good hockey player. And in Canada, that means something. Yeah. It doesn't mean as much in America. I wish it did. It's a great sport. But there are other sports that have higher priority in America. So here's what comes from that research, a term called biological age, which is very important. And basically from this point on, if I'm talking about an age, I'm talking about a biological age. 
So what they do is they graph not their growth, because I don't know how tall everybody's going to be. You know, when I was 10 years old, I didn't know how tall I was going to be. You don't really know. I mean, you can look at your parents. That's going to give you a little clue. But what this is looking at here is the velocity of growth. And we see that based off of biological age, at six, you're growing, and then you kind of slow down for a little bit, and then you shoot up a growth spurt. You know, and then you have sort of your peak, and then your growth slows down to, you know, at about 18, you know, basically when you come, become mature adults. There are gender differences. This lighter blue is females, and the darker blue is males. And you see this. If you walk around a middle school, you see this. You see females towering over their male counterparts in 6th, 7th grade. And then by ninth grade, the males catch up, and then eventually, you know, they're going to usually overtake with height and things like that. And then we also have, at the top here, this peak is peak height velocity. That is when you're growing the fastest. Very, very important when it comes to training. It's a major factor in long-term athletic development. Major factor. You know, to the point where you look at all the research from Canada, you know, obviously Canada, it's up north. So they're going to be predominantly more of a winter sport country. You know, in the last Olympic Games, they had the most gold medals. And that kind of made the Americans mad. They really got into it, you know, because, you know, Canada, 70% of the population lives about a car ride away from America. So, you know, they're going to take notice. And we really have, as far as developing, you know, our Olympic training programs. You know, they're really following the model that was laid out by the Canadians as far as starting at a young age, and I'll go through that. But don't tell the Chinese. They don't do it that way. What the Chinese do is when you're four years old, your parents decide what sport you're going to be the best in the world at. And they ship you off to gymnastics school or whatever school, table tennis school. And you do eight hours a day in that school. And you either make it or you don't. You know, if they were smart enough to know how kids actually develop, how not kids, but human beings in general, how they develop, they would knock the socks off every country because they have more people. You've got more people doing it the right way. Right now, they compete because they have 20% you know, of the world population in one country. So they do OK. But they also do, if I bring back the growth curve here, what do the Chinese dominate at? Early specialization sports, gymnastics, diving. Their females dominate golf. South Koreans dominate women's golf. They got like 12 of the top 25 players, like half. They develop early. You know, I mean, South Korea has golfers 16 years old, number one in the world. I don't even know what their names are, but yeah. Where Tiger Woods, he's way down here. Yeah. Men develop a lot. They reach their peak a lot later. Yeah, but those early specialization, because in China, I bet you they all burn out. I don't know. I'm just guessing. You know, you start at four nonstop. By the time you're about 12, it's time to get out. Yeah, you've got enough. You know, and in gymnastics, that's good enough. You've got to go to the next Olympics, and then you're done. Because you only get one shot in gymnastics. You know, the Americans, you won't see any of those American gymnasts, female gymnasts, next to them. They'll be too old and too developed. You know, they'll be down here. You know, where they're, they were here. Most likely here from a biological standpoint. Because they all have to be 15, 16, I don't know what it is in the Olympics. They don't have to be that old, but biologically, they're most likely here. Just based off body size. But I was born to play this sport. Who thinks Tiger Woods was born to play golf? He wasn't. That's BS. How do I know? If you want to know, read these books. Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Talent is Overrated, Jeff Colvin, The Talent Code, about the same book. And then this is the little book of talent, which is sort of the, I don't want to say Cliff Notes version. Uh, it just came out within the last month. 
These books tell you how those people became the most successful people in the world, not just in sports. Mozart, you know, different artists and things. Fantastic reads. I recommend them to all the athletes, you know, the serious athletes that we work with, the guys that come in here and are training for a pro day for the NFL Combine, you know, our professional athletes. I recommend these books. It talks specifically about how to become successful in the sport. And they're easy reads. Yeah, it's not like you need a PhD in order to read these books. You just sit down and read it. Yeah, some of you can't even, outliers you can't even sit down. You know, fantastic reads. It's going to talk about you know, all those aspects of success. Anybody read any of these books before? Yeah? I read Outliers. Outliers? Yeah, Outliers? Yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic references, you know, that are going to talk specifically about that. You know, there are certain ways to practice, deliberate practice as far as being successful. From the book Outliers, in the first chapter, there's going to be a section that talks about hockey. January passes to March, March passes to February, on and on and on and on. What does that mean? He was looking at junior hockey in Canada. And he was looking at the roster of a specific a junior hockey team that was in the finals you know, of junior hockey in Canada. So it's like the World Series, basically. Junior hockey is going to be from, you know, usually 18 to 20, as far as how old they are. And when looking at the roster, they posted the birth dates, and they found out that the majority of the players on this specific junior hockey team were born in the first third of the year, January, March, February, April, to the tune of like 80%. And they looked at other teams, and they were all very, very similar you know, as far as their birthdays. And found it very odd. But when you look at it developmentally, again, like I talked about, hockey is one of those sports where, you know, all the kids born in 1990 are all on the same team. So what happens is the kids that were born in January are the oldest kids that were born in 1990. So they just, you know, just based off of statistics are going to be the most developed. So therefore, they're more successful because they get better coaching from a younger age. They developed earlier. They get better coaching. They get pushed into better leagues onto better teams with better coaches. And they develop much, much better. And when they get into the junior program, you know, it's the cream of the crop. And it's the kids that have got the best coaching through their whole development. In Outliers, they mention teams from soccer teams from the Czech Republic. Again, 70 to 80 percent born in the first third of the year. Now, very, very interesting stuff. And uh, junior hockey, okay, 